So today I want to talk about chisel technique. Um, if you're hand wood woodworking, then uh, being good with the chisel is, is essential. Uh, if your chisel technique technique's a bit ropey, then you're going to lose accuracy. Uh, the work's going to take longer, and it's it's just not going to be so enjoyable. So I'm hoping to give you a few tips here, which will um, make your, your woodwork, your hand woodwork, a little bit more fulfilling, perhaps. Um, some uh, sort of essentials before you even get started. Uh, one is um, we're assuming that your, your, your chisel's very sharp. Uh, you can't do good work with, the, with blunt tools. And um, if your sharpening technique isn't so brilliant, then you might want to have a look at me uh, uh, sharpening video. I'll post a link to it. Um, the other thing is, uh, a little safety thing, uh, you should always have both hands behind the sharp end because um, uh, we don't want to get the red stuff on the, on the wood. And so the idea is that uh, both hands should be around the handle on the, on the shaft of the, the chisel. And related to that is um, you, you, get be you get better work if, 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 you, if your workpiece is actually held firmly in the vise or clamped or in some way between the bench dogs on your vise. You don't want to be holding the piece with one hand and chiseling with the other hand. Uh, firstly, because you're more likely to end up with, uh, with the red stuff on the wood. And also, it's, it's, it's just you don't get such a good cut because you're, you're sort of battling against yourself all the time. If you can get both hands on the chisel, rather than one hand holding the wood and one hand holding the chisel, then things are going to be a lot more easy and less hectic. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, accuracy comes from cutting to some sort of impressed line rather than a pencil line. Uh, so even before you pick up the chisel, uh, you're thinking about accuracy by using a marking knife or a gauge of some sort so you've got actually got something you can engage your chisel with rather than uh, sort of a pencil line which is a bit wishy-washy. Uh, so let's um, get on with it. So I'm going to start. Here I've got a tenon which I've cut and it's a little bit tight in the mortise so I need to take a little bit off, off one face. Now many people the natural thing to do would be to sort of work it like that but can you see it's, it's not happening very well. It, 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 the, what's, the problem is the grain's running down that way and it's wanting to follow the, um, the line of the grain. So I'm getting a, quite a rough, rough cut there and, and it's not very accurate. Um, usually when you're pa pairing a tenon, it's a lot, more, a lot easier, a lot more accurate to actually pair across the grain like that because you, you've actually taken the grain out of the equation really. Um, uh, because, well, basically because you're cutting across it, so <laughs> you know, there's not the tendency to, to follow the grain. And I think you get a, a cleaner cut also across the grain. Um, so I've come around the other side here, and I'm just working the way across, like that. chopping off the waste there. So you can see it's a lot cleaner than, if, than when I was working that way. So I'd, I'd, I'd suggest whenever you're pairing a tenon or anything like that, then you actually do it across the grain rather than with the grain. And you notice the technique, I've, I'm, I've got my index finger there like that, and I'm pressing down with my thumb, and the pressure with the, from the thumb gets the cut started. And once the cut's going, then you can proceed. Whilst we're talking about tenons, I just wanted to mention sandpaper. Uh, I do find that quite often, especially beginners, uh, they tend to, for that sort of situation where you're thinning down a, a tenon, they tend to get the, get the old sandpaper out and have a go at it with, the, with sandpaper to try and, try and thin it down. And I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a mistake really, uh, partly because sandpaper is not very good at cutting anyway, so it doesn't, it doesn't work very fast. Uh, so you're taking ages doing it. And also, it's not accurate. It has a natural tendency to round things over. So in general situations where, where something needs cutting, don't use sandpaper, use a plane or a chisel, some edge tool. Um, uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, sandpaper is only really, you should only get the sandpaper out when you come to the end of the job and you're finishing it. And occasionally when, you know, you've done a rounding over or something, you just want to blend in a curve, which we'll look at later on. Um, but certainly, I would avoid using sandpaper for any sort of uh, sort of like cutting situation. 
Um, I think then that what, the reason people tend to use sandpaper is because the chiselling technique isn't very good. But if you can improve your chiselling technique, you shouldn't need to sort of get the sandpaper out. Um, that's the end, end of the, me rant about sandpaper. Uh, I do have a thing about files as well. <laughs> I can't bring myself to file wood. Uh, it just seems a bit of an insult to the wood. Uh, you know, I, I'd much prefer to use an edge tool on it. Um, yeah, that's some old fashioned, I don't know. So, um, here we've got a, um, a housing I'm cutting out. I've cut the shoulders either side and I've put a couple of waist cuts in to break up the waist. And um, I, I'm doing this really to sort of show you a little bit about mallet work. Um, I do cover this uh, a bit on uh, an early video of mine about cutting a lap joint. I'll, I'll post a link to that if you're interested. Um, so, I'm doing a bit of mallet work to start with to just get cut down to the gauge line, down, lower down there. And the tendency is to sort of want to sort of go like that. Um, the problem is you've got no stability. It's difficult to get the, the, the chisel in the right place and everything. If you get stability, if you put your elbow on the vice or on the work or something, or if it's a very small piece, you can put your wrist on the work, but you just need some, some way of stabilising your arm. And then it's a lot easier to get the chisel in the right place. And I'm cutting uphill at the moment. Uh, and then I'll come in from the other side later on. So I'm working my way down. And you want to try to get so you're just a smidgen above the, the gauge line, a smidgen, about half, half a millimetre. Uh, and then once you've got to the half a millimetre, the, then you can just engage your chisel in the, in the line there. I can feel the chisel actually sitting in there. I'm trying to twist it. I can't move it because it's sit, sat in the, in the gauge line. That's one of the principles of, of chiselling. You never go straight to the line, you always creep up on it. So I'm to keep the surfaces nice and clean and, and flat. There we are, it's a bit, bit ridgy there where it's, uh, the wood's broken out a bit. This is a uh, beach I'm doing this in. Now if I turn it round, coming from the other side. Now it's going to be a little bit more difficult for me this now uh, and I'm going to have to move the uh, camera a little bit as well. That's better. It's going to be a bit more difficult for me now because I haven't got a lot of uh, anywhere to put me, me arm so I'm going to just rest my wrist on the corner here just to stabilise things. So I've just got that smidgen left above and then drop the chisel into the line. Now I'm going to change over to hand pairing. And if you look, I've got my um, elbow tucked into my hip. And I'm holding the, the chisel, I've got my index finger against the edge of the work, work and I've got my thumb on top, and that controls the cut. So pressure from the thumb at the start of the cut gets the chisel to work. And then I'm driving the chisel forward by leaning my body forward. And hopefully you can see that I'm getting nice clean surfaces. I'm working back in back there. I'm just chasing the high spot back. But you can see I'm getting nice clean surfaces. If you work the chisel like that, you end up with it all sort of rough and ridgy and you can't really see what's going on. 
And as you get your elbow tapped into your hip, drive the chisel forward with your body, leaning into it. Nice clean surfaces, you can see what's happening all the time. I'm just going to put a few pencil marks on there so you can see where the cut's got to. So I've created a nice flat all the way along there. And this bit here is the remains of the, um, the slope where we cut the other direction. I'm chasing the high spot back just by changing the angle of the chisel after each cut. But all the time I'm only putting the chisel on this edge here because this edge here is a reference. So I'm putting the chisel on the edge but not cutting into it. Right, so that's pretty flat that way so I'm going to turn the chisel around, turn the piece around and come in from the other side I like to have it overhanging from the um, from the vice because then I can get my, my, my index finger in there to control the cut whereas if I've got it there it's, it's more difficult So now what I'm doing is I'm working my way down until I, my chisel is just sitting on that corner where the gauge line was originally. A little bit sticking up there, so I'm just going to run the chisel down like that. Just to cut through the fibres to get rid of that bit in the corner there. Similarly here. not looking too, there's a little bit of a hump at the back there. That's good there. And I'm being careful not to cut out the back because I'm trying to keep these two reference lines here. That's about right. Oh, the humps are there now. Right, that's about it. So you can see that was quite quite quick, um, partly because of this technique of driving the the, uh, the chisel by driving moving your body backwards and forwards, uh, and I think it gives it a more accurate cut as well. So it's faster and more accurate. Uh, one little tip: there's a bit of blood on the wood. I don't know where that's come from. I think that's from previously, um, but uh, you can find that when you're going like that, when you're pairing like that, you can end up with a couple of cuts. You can end up with a couple of cuts in your finger, there and there, where the chisel's running backwards and forwards. So it's worth just, if, well, if you've got a new chisel, probably older chisel, it's probably not the case, but if you've got a new chisel, then, then just give it a rub on a stone, on the corners like that, just to take the sharp edge off, and then you won't get that problem with the, um, Yeah, you won't get that problem. <laughs> here we've got an end grain pairing situation. Uh, I've got this sort of finger joint here. Could be a dovetail joint. Uh, so basically, we, we, we're looking at situations where you're going to be pairing uh, end grain. Uh, now, I suppose you could work this with a mallet. Like that. But I find I've, I have more control if I... Um, uh, pair it. So what I'm doing is I've, I've got the, the chisel held in a, uh, a stabbing grip and if I use my sort of rest back of my hand on there and use my thumb and forefinger to position the, the chisel, I'm just going to get rid of that bit I, where I'm at it. So I'm holding it with a stabbing grip I've got the back of my hand resting there and I'm using my forefinger and index finger to guide the chisel in and then I just put my, my weight, my, my body weight down onto it so it's rather like where I was pairing the other, the other way 
I'm using my body weight to drive the chisel basically. Um, that didn't go so well. There we go. And I'm angling it slightly so there's no danger of undercutting. I'm working my way back until I can just get the I've come a little bit too close actually. There we are. Get the chisel in that in that gauge line. Clean up the corners. So I basically I've, I've sawn out the waste with a coping saw. Um, so you can see the action I've got stabbing at hold and then I've got my index finger and thumb controlling the, the way it's going in. And just got my body on top of the end of the chisel. And just a little bit there, can you see that little less than half a millimeter? I would say left when I'll go to the line. Got a little bit of a problem, the gauge line wasn't quite right there. That's right, I'll just flip it over. Okay, so got a of, uh, scrap to protect the bench. Come down the other way. Into the knife line. into the knife line again. Right. So what I've got now is, similar to when I was doing the cross grain pairing, I've got the uh, slope up from either side. So now I'm going to take it around, put it in the vise like that, move my cameras around so you can see what I'm doing the other way. So I've um, changed the uh, piece in the, put the piece in the vise and I've also put some pencil marks on to help you see where the cut's happening. The actual high point, you know, I've cut in from that way and that way. The high point is, is about there on each of these. So now I'm going to pair away. Um, so it's a similar sort of principle to when we were pairing cross grain. So I've got my el um, elbow tucked into my hip and I'm driving the chisel forward. pushing my body forward. So I'm just placing the chisel on that corner, not taking it any further down because we've got that reference there which is where that knife line was. And can you see how the, the high point is moving further and further back each time. So I'll say you could do, use this sort of technique when you're pairing out between dovetails as well. And the same on this side. Come in from the other side. Clean up the corners. So you can see all the time I'm trying to keep the surfaces nice and clean and flat. And I'm achieving that by this driving the chisel forward with my body weight. If you're sort of hacking at it, you know, sort of like that, you end up with an uneven surface where you can't see what's going on. With this, I can see exactly what's happening all the time. Slight hump in the middle there. Uh, 
Right, that's about right, I think. Quite often with this situation, you find that it, you end up with a sort of a bit of a plateau all the way along, the, and then it just drops away at the very end. There's a little bit there. You need to make sure it's flat right from one corner to the other. So as you can see, we've got a nice, fairly clean recess there now. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> sort of pairing to a, a curve, you know, shape, making, a, a, a <clears throat> making a shape on a corner or something like that. Um, now I've marked out this, this curve here um, just to sort of round over a corner. Now I could, I could take a lot of that off with a, co with a coping saw, but I'm going to um, just work, work my way back to it. To, as I say, I could have got the coping saw out, but I couldn't be bothered really. Um, so I'm going to work at it, I'm going to hold the chisel with a stabbing grip and I'm again using my index finger and thumb to control and I can chop down like that, it's quite easy wood to cut, it's sort of some British uh, walnut. Uh, so I'm just, and you can see I've got this same again, I'm using my body weight to drive, drive the chisel. Now I know I keep mentioning but <laughs> using the body weight and sort of I'm quite a tall fairly well built bloke so uh, it works for me now some people who aren't quite so robust might find it a little bit more difficult possibly <sighs> blinking mobiles So after that dis interruption, let's uh, carry on. So I was saying that um, if you have a lighter constitution, then you'll obviously have to take finer, finer cuts. So what I've done is I've taken the corner off here, working back to the line. And then I'm going to take the other corner off the other two corners off either side so I'm sort of I suppose I'm sort of creating a sort of part polygon and I'm turning the polygon into a sort of um, more of a circle by taking the corners off each time and I'm trying to make sure that I sort of chop down pretty well square I'll have to Put a square on it in a minute. So I'm almost round to the so it's a little bit sort of ridgy. There's there's a bit of a high spot there I can take a bit more off. Right, that's pretty well there. Right, so this might be one of the times when I actually use the sandpaper. I'm pretty much there. It's a pity you can't feel this really, but it's, it's sort of feeling fairly a regular, fairly regular curve, um, just with a little bit lumpy in places, but that should come away when we sand it. I've reluctantly got the sandpaper out <laughs> um, and so I'm just going to work around that corner. I, I did check earlier that it's square and it's looking pretty good. So I'm just working around the corner. And that's pretty much there. So you can see that using a sort of disciplined chiseling technique uh, we've achieved that rounding fairly quickly with very little sanding involved. Uh, when, you, when you are sanding, it's always a good idea to use a sanding block rather than sort of doing it, doing it like that. If you do it like that, then you end up with, with a sort of a rounding. As I say, sandpaper is very good at rounding things. 
Um, another little tip, completely unrelated to uh, this thing, is I've got a bit of a thing about um, tearing up sandpaper. Uh, sand if you have it, if you do it in pieces like that. That means that you've you've got an econo you're using quite economically. And having lived in the Yorkshire for quite a while, then economic using stuff crudely is quite important to me. So you can see I can sort of move this around repeatedly until I've used it all. Whereas if you use certain sandpaper sort of like that, uh, or like that, it's not the economical way of doing it. And the way I achieve it is I fold it into thirds along the length, and then... Turn them away like that. And I reckon that's the most cost effective way of using the sandpaper so you can move it along each time. I hope you found those few chiseling tips uh, useful. Um, if you're interested in getting other tips and hints about woodwork, uh, you might want to subscribe to my uh, channel. There is a subscribe button uh, somewhere on this screen somewhere. Um, and if you have been, thanks for listening.